And hello, everybody. It is Tom Chenault. It's Adrian Chenault. It is the Legacy Leadership Radio Show, and we are going to have some fun today. We have known this little whippersnapper a very, very long time. We love him. His father-in-law used to live a couple miles from here. So we've been a fan of Jordan Kemper for a long, long time. Great kid. Adrian likes him far better than me because you're closer to the same age. Share a lot of things in common. Both dads, both trying to figure out a way to balance all this stuff. And uh, we think the lesson today is balance. We think the lesson today is not only be a good businessman, but to be a tremendous family man, first and foremost. And uh, you two exemplify that to me. And how you doing? I'm good. I've been looking forward to this conversation. And yeah, it, uh, it certainly is. Uh, a juggling act. <laughs> yeah, hard work. Kids throwing up all the time. Unbelievable. Take it away, baby. It's too too soon, man. Too soon. We <laughs> we my house is a is a hazmat zone right now. I feel like so it's it's very good to be at the studio to get to hang out with Mister Mister Jordan Kemper. So Jordan, how are you today? I'm good. Tom and Adrian, thanks for uh, connecting with me. It's it's a treat to be on with both of you at the same time. Well, you look like you've gotten yourself into a little bit bulkier. Are you lifting weights or something? You kind of were like a little right. string bean. When I met you, you were fit, but you weren't all bulked up. What have you been doing? Well, I've got a, I've got a gym in the garage. So uh, with the baby uh, waking up around 7, 8 o'clock, I try to get my workouts in beforehand and uh, trying to stay fit. Well, you look good. <laughs> that is awesome. I love it. I love it. So Jordan and I, you and I connected good a long time ago. You know, when when you guys first met, I think at a, an Eric Warre event, and it instantly, you know, your background having gone to Wheaton College, which is someplace that I had looked at going, didn't it? I I got went and visited in January, and that disavowed me of that idea because uh, Wheaton's right outside Chicago. That is Illinois. the surface of the moon. <laughs> it was. That was cold. Uh, so I didn't end up going there, but I, I love that school. And I, I just, you know, from the get go have admired your values, have admired, you know, what you stand for and the way you go about building your life and your business. And so, you know, Jordan, talk a little bit about your background and, and how, because you were, you know, highly educated, you know, all, all of the above and gravitated towards the network marketing profession from a really young age. How did that come about for you? Yeah, so I don't have that typical story, but uh, I loved growing up in a Midwest town, Rockford. I went to Wheaton College. I was recruited there to play basketball, and I don't think I would have gotten into Wheaton had I not been recruited to play basketball because the uh, ACT scores weren't quite as high as I'd like them to be, but got in, had a great experience there, uh, last two years played football, but I did go on the pre-med path, and uh, I took the MCAT, I took all the prerequisites, and I was ready to Western, uh, leaving college. And what's interesting is I think like probably many of you that are listening to this, I felt like I kind of started down a path. And because I started down the path, I felt like I had to finish the path. But that's not life, right? I actually deep in my heart felt like that wasn't the direction I really wanted to go. So just to make sure I interned about 200 hours with four medical groups most of the doctors that I spent time with told me, Jordan, if I could go back in time, I'd do something different. And I thought, well, gee, I wish somebody would have done for organic chemistry. Um, but here we were, and I met a doctor, and he happened to be a part of the network marketing profession. And, you know, my mom had been a part of a skincare company. She'd sold Tupperware and Pampered Chef, and she'd tried different brands. And I'd, I'd never seen it done successfully. But I thought if a doctor was doing it, I'll sit down and listen to him. And that was the beginning of my network marketing experience. I, I went to coffee with him. I spent 13 years uh, with that company building a successful organization. I spent one year uh, building a startup company. And then we transitioned to a, another company these past two years. So over my 16-year career, I've been with a a dinosaur company. I've been with a startup company and then I've been with a company that kind of meets in the middle. And so network marketing has always been a part of my life. Uh, I should say from an entrepreneurial side. And then because of network marketing, um, it opened my eyes to multiple streams of income. So really over probably the last seven, eight years, I've also started adding different income streams, but network marketing nonetheless has always been a part of my, uh, of my professional focus. 
And how old are you? Like 12? <laughs> uh, <Look> uh, <laughs> how old I are you? Started, I started at 22. I'm 38 now. So you're his age. When's your birthday? Uh, August 30th, uh, 1984. You guys are like close. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm October. You got a couple months on me, Jordan. We, could, we yep. would have been classmates at Wheaton. That's actually you really been, weird. Yeah, you would have been. I had not put that together. We would have been the same year. That's crazy. So yeah. Adrian got full ride scholarship offers to Pepperdine Wheaton in this dumpy little college down in Texas named Trinity. And I definitely didn't want him to go to Wheaton. That was horrible. I wanted him to go to Pepperdine and he chose the dumpy little college down in Texas called Trinity. And it was the best decision. He learned to think he was a hundred percent right in that choice. And uh, just like you at Wheaton and the Chamber of Commerce had here to the, in Longmont, Colorado, went to Bob Jones, which is even tougher. And I'm going, you know, so every time I see him, I just tip my hat to him because I'm telling you what, you get an education in those joints and you just better toe the line or you're <laughs> off the line. So I'm in awe of you, Jordan Kemper. I love you. How's your father-in-law? Bob's good. In fact, he's here at the house hanging out with our three-year-old right now. So All right, uh, good. Tell him we well. miss him here in Longmont, Colorado. Will you please? Yep, I sure will. All right, that's too funny. How cool. So, okay, so so you're you're down this sort of pre-med track. First of all, kudos to you cuz I, you know, so often people give you advice like that and you still can't hear it and you you know, you insist on going and learning the hard way instead of taking good counsel. And so it's cool that you did that. What did your parents think though? I mean, like that's a pretty big departure from medical physician to network marketer like, "Hey, Mom and dad, I've had a change of career aspirations. Like, how did that go? You know, my dad was actually a general contractor. And part of the reason he chose to go into that space was because he wanted to be in business for himself. He wanted to control his hours. He wanted to determine what he was and wasn't worth. He wanted to set the hours in which he would work and the hours he'd be around for his family. And so my parents always supported me. They knew I was a hard worker. They knew that I always gave my best effort. And so they knew that if I was going to go a different path, they knew that I would be successful at whatever I put my heart into. So I was extremely fortunate that I had parents that supported uh, my decision and uh, they applauded me and tried to help me as much as I could when I kind of, uh, I guess you could say, changed paths. Yeah, that's really cool. And so you got into you got into this this company that you spent the you know the early part the, a significant part of your network marketing career and experience with up until this point you had a lot of success there you know what as a kid coming out of college getting exposed to this like what were some of the important lessons that you learned early on that allowed you to to be one of the the top people in the company that you were with and and have a lot of success there yeah you know, it's interesting when I think about network marketing, um, a lot of people call it a disguise for personal development. And early, I didn't know what that meant. Um, I went to Wheaton. I took all of the necessary classes. I took all the gen eds. I took all of the science class. I did everything I was told to do. But what was interesting was I felt like most of what I learned in college didn't translate to the real world. Nobody taught me about residual income. Nobody taught me about taxes. Nobody taught me about social media or people skills, I felt like no one really gave me what I needed. Uh, college taught me how to manage my time. College taught me how to work hard. College taught me how to become independent. College taught me how to network. So there were massive benefits to my time at Wheaton. But I felt like when I stepped into network marketing, uh, it's a 1099 situation where you're only paid if you produce. And so I walked into a situation where if I didn't uh, make sales, if I didn't move products, there was no commission for me. There was no opportunity for me to, to pay my bills. And so I tell people that if you want to transition to an entrepreneur, maybe you've been an employee for a number of years, or maybe you're just coming out of college, wh wherever you're at in life, if you like the, the path of entrepreneurship, get yourself a good network marketing company and participate there for five years. And what those five years will teach you is how to deal with rejection, how to overcome adversity, how to have the ups and the downs that comes with business, how to learn marketing, how to learn accounting, how to, how to minimize your tax liability. All of the things that you learn 
when you become an entrepreneur. But the cool part for me with, with network marketing was the barrier of entry was low, the risk was low. And so it was the perfect opportunity for me. But you know, a lot of professors thought I was crazy. A lot of my teammates and colleagues thought I was nuts. They thought I should go the, the traditional path. And it wasn't really till a few years in that my friends were like, okay, maybe he did make the right decision. Maybe this yeah. was the best path for him. Where'd you find the girl? So I met my wife on Twitter. <laughs> on on Twitter. Twitter. All right, good. Adrian thought that we're was all, a where Adrian. all good love stories begin. Wow. And Adrian yeah, thought that was a terrible question. question, by the way. No, no, that's that's no joke. I uh, I went on a horrible date with a girl in Indianapolis. And uh, if I told you that story, I don't think people believe it. But nonetheless, that girl retweeted something from Kristen Rocco. And I thought, man, this girl's beautiful. She had some quotes and tweets and things that just kind of, I don't know, popped off the page. And so I started following her on Twitter, then Instagram, then Facebook. And uh, I was in the business of sales, so I wasn't afraid of follow-up or rejection. So I just kind of started to pursue her. Eventually got her phone number, asked her if I could give her a call. She thought that was a bit strange because she was used to texting and one conversation led to the next, and now we've been married almost eight years. She's a heck of a girl. That's cool. She is. That's really that's an amazing story. Thank you. And yeah, whatever. Uh, what are the? Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> that the bad the bad date retweeted the future wife, and uh, the rest is history. That's right. Now, did she live in Longmont, Colorado, at that point? No, she actually grew up in Tampa, Florida, where, where we live now. All right. Darn it. That would have even been the icing on the cake. Good long, long, long Longmont girl makes good, but no deal. <laughs> Unbelievable. Good. That is super, super cool. Uh, I, I love it. And and you you have a beautiful, you said almost three-year-old now. Is that right? Well, she's three and a half. Yeah. She's almost three and three and half, four. Yeah. Yep. Oh man. So exciting. That is, there's, there's nothing better than that. <laughs> and so in a second, we're gonna take a quick break here. Uh, on the other side, we definitely should get into fatherhood and and what it's like as you continue to build some build big things and and do it while honoring being a dad and being a husband and all that kind of stuff because it is it's so so important. Uh, this is this is my kind of stuff. This is super cool, and I'm I'm just so tickled that we're like basically the same age. That's pretty cool. So you're listening to the Legacy Leadership Show with Adrian Chenault and Tom Chenault. We are talking to Jordan Kemper, entrepreneur extraordinaire, and we'll be back right after this. Stick around. All right, awesome. This What's going fun. on, Sean Miller? Thank you for all your great posts about us. Doug Stare, you tag and machine. Denise Chenault is running up. A mountain, not walking, running up straight up a mountain called Mount Sanitas oh, in Boulder. Cool. And that's Dang, what she's that's doing. No, that's no joke. Last week I said she was walking and she took great offense. So I have to clarify Sprinting. that. Sprinting up the mountain. <laughs> so we're coming back right now. <clears throat> and we're back. It is the Legacy Leadership Radio Show with Tom Chenault, Jordan Kemper, and his little boy, Adrian. And we are having a tremendous time Adrian wanted to go down one path, but I'm taking it down another. That's all right. So here's the deal. Jordan, all of a sudden, he's just bigger than life in this company. And all I hear about is how much of a rock star he is. And all of a sudden, I'm just getting hammered by Amazon sales. And I cannot figure out how on earth these commies keep doing all this backdooring <laughs> on Amazon. And so I start doing some research into who the geniuses are to stop those criminals from sliding underneath the good, honest distributors and peeling their money away from them after doing all the hard work. So I do. So I go, I ask like 10 people who the best person is to talk to. And finally, the consensus was guess who? I'm going to say Kristen Rocco. No, Kristen <laughs> Rocco's husband, <Okay. laughs> Jordan. And it was unbelievable. And he talked about multiple streams of income. But I think what's important about what he said was no matter what you do, be the best at it. And he saw it in another opening that wasn't going to conflict with his network marketing company and went out and really became the expert there. And the rest is history yet one more time. Right, Jordan? Yeah, it's interesting. I 2015, a friend of mine was probably, I would say, the world expert when it came to telecom uh, contract law. 
And I knew of his reputation. I knew what he had done. He asked me if I would market a very specific opportunity to the Fortune 500 companies. And I had no corporate sales experience, but I knew that I had hard work and things I'd learned through network marketing. So I decided to partner with him. Uh, I onboarded, gosh, between my brother and I, I think we onboarded 42 Fortune 500 companies to that specific initiative. And after I went through that, I said, I'm actually pretty good at sales and corporate sales and business development, but most of my network is actually related to network marketing. So I thought, what if I could consult for um, companies specific to what their pain points were? And you and I both know, Tom, what most of those pain points were. Shipping and logistics, Amazon, uh, customer retention, et cetera. So I uh, actually sought out a few of the best firms related to those pain points, and I started doing business development for them. One of those happened to be uh, Uncut Brands, and uh, we uh, helped with Amazon Solutions, and we've done so for uh, quite a number of the big network marketing companies. So I am all for multiple streams of income, and I felt like, to your point, uh, I could add value in that space without compromising my network marketing business. So- what I want people to get is Jordan, by now you have figured out since age 22, now age 38, that the kid's got a really strong Rolodex, but he never lets it rest. And no matter what happens, he is keeping track of the people that he's met for that day down the road that he may have be able to help them. They might be able to help him, but he never blows a relationship. And throughout that conversation that we had around uncut brands, I will tell you that of the top 10 follow-up people that I ever met in my life, Jordan's on that list. And that's a huge tribute to me because I am absolutely monomaniacal about it, opinionated about it, and pretty pissed off about most of the people that are supposedly pretty good at it that suck. So you aren't, and I love you very, very much for that. It is very it's a big compliment. Yeah, it was. I just promise that, it was. That it for sure is. And, and it's true and it's so powerful. And, and you know, a lot of people get intimidated by the thought of going and selling into the Fortune 500, for example. And you've done that. You've done the network marketing thing. And I'm curious, do you like, is it a situation where people are just people or is it a completely different world? Like what have you learned from spanning that wide range of organizations and people that you've worked with? Yeah. You know, Kiyosaki says that your, your network is your net worth. Again, I didn't really understand. I didn't understand that when I read it originally. Now I understand it. And uh, I would say that if you're, if you're trying to figure out, what skills are most important to develop? There's a reason that Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People has sold more than 70 million copies. I truly believe that no matter what business you choose, it's going to involve people. And so the better people skills you can develop, the more successful you will be at whatever profession you elect to choose. And I've seen real estate agents, insurance agents, business owners, network marketers, you name it. The people that have the best people skills are the ones that see the most success. And people skills are always something that we can develop. There's something that we can improve. And so as I, I mean, if I pulled out my cell phone right now, I mean, I've got 6,000 contacts in my phone where I could send a text, a voice note, or a quick phone call, and that person would pick up the phone. And that's because I've spent years developing relationships that matter, that mean the world to me. And whether or not I engage that person in an opportunity where we can financially benefit from one another or not doesn't matter to me. My goal is how can I add value to my network? How can I add value to others? And by doing so, it creates an enormous amount of financial opportunities, which I've been able to participate in. Best short break in the history of this show. We'll be right back. True story. That was so. You that was so crushed good. it. I am the hero. So <laughs> I am the hero. Oh honestly. my god! Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, he's right on the money. You, you guys, please stop. Throw your agenda out the window. Map everybody. Remember things. Put them in a rotation to remember. And at the end of the day, you are going to have a picture of me in your wallet, right alongside Jordan. We're back right now. 
And welcome back. It's Tom Chenault. It's Adrian Chenault. It is the Legacy Leadership Radio Show on the Genesis Communication Network. And this is an important show because I'm telling you, whether you're in corporate America, the banks yesterday are having a big, big problem. Husbands coming home, really, really all stressed out. And then you got the network marketing space where everybody's working at home and there's a chance to really balance work and family and relationship and doesn't mean you don't have to work, but you really have a fighting chance at keeping families together and making the main thing the main thing. So take it away, Adrian. Yeah, so that was so good what we were talking about before the break. And, and so I, I want to go there in a second, but I, I, I want to close that piece out because you have, through all of the things that you've done in network marketing and in all of these other spaces, what you, what I heard you say before the break that you have done is you have developed, main, collected, and maintained this, this group of people that have a specific connection and relationship with you and that all of these doors of the consulting, of these sales jobs that you've been able to do, of coaching, of starting a company and then ultimately going and joining a different company that you're with now that you guys are loving what you're doing. All of those doors you're saying have, have essentially opened through the relationships that you've created, right? Yeah. I mean, it's influence. Maxwell says it. leadership is influence, right? And so I find that people that have more influence tend to be able to, uh, initiate more business deals, uh, attract bigger deals, uh, I really believe that increasing your contact list, increasing your network is important, but it's a process. And, you know, you, you meet those people who only can talk business, right? They don't know how to like retreat back and realize that it's probably a relationship, relationship oriented business. What can you do to move the relationship forward? And we all know that we do business with people we know, like, and trust. And oftentimes, We'll choose an inferior company or inferior service solely because we trust the individual that brought it to us. So you have to increase your influence, better improve your relationships, and you'll get more deals done. That's so cool. And, and you're right. You know, you think about the people who I most admire, whether I admire them up close or from a distance. You talk to people that are are very powerful. You talk to people that are very successful. And how do they work? They work by they pick up the phone and they make things happen because there is this credibility. There is this, you know, they, they know that they have this leverage that's created through doing that, that is so, so powerful. And so that doesn't happen on accident. That doesn't happen. You know, you're still a very young guy to have developed 6,000 relationships that are in your phone that you're proactive about staying in touch with and staying on top of those things don't happen without some intention. And so yeah. how, what is, what is your system? Like, what does that look like for you that helps you to, to actually follow through on that and to maintain it over these last 16 years? Well, let, let's take it back to when I met the two of you guys. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I was at the GoPro event. Uh, I think I was one of the speakers that particular year in Vegas. Uh, my friend Lisa Grossman was sitting out there playing the slot machines. And uh, she's on she here, by the way. Me, she told me that I needed to meet Tom Chenault. Now, let me say this. First and foremost, it always means a lot to me that someone's willing to, to invite me into their network. I don't take that lightly first. So I, I wanted to value the relationship. I remember sitting down with Tom in a coffee shop. I remember getting his phone number and I remember writing some notes in my phone. Lives in Longmont, Colorado. He's a part of this company. We met in a coffee shop in Vegas. Like I took notes because I knew that days and weeks would go by and my brain would get full of different information. And I, I, I wanted to remember the moment that I met Tom. Fast forward. He introduced, he introduced me to you. And I remember him talking about his love for you, that you were kind of trying to sift through and figure out your way. I remember you were in Australia at that point. I remember the first time we connected. Again, as soon as I finished the conversation, I took some notes in my phone. There are notes on both of your names in my contacts. And I do that for every single person that I meet. Because when I talk to a person on the phone or I see them face to face, I'll just take a quick glance at my phone if I can't remember. And I'll be like, that's where I met this person. His, his daughter's name is this. His son's name is this. 
He likes to do this for fun. This is his favorite sports team. Anything that I can pull away from the conversation, because what does Dale Carnegie said? He says, talk in terms of other people's interests, ask questions, be slow to speak, slow to speak. I can't talk slow to speak, quick to listen and make people feel special and important. Well, I can do that for each person that I meet because I take the time and the energy to take notes on each person that I meet so that when we have another conversation, I can bring those details back into the conversation, knowing what matters to you. Is there anything better than that? Well, I do it intuitively. First thing I ask you about was your father-in-law, who's your wife's dad, who you love more than air in your lungs. And all of a sudden that creates relatedness. Then we went to Wheaton College, relatedness. All you, everybody stop. I mean, why is Lisa Grossman so connected? The woman cannot even spell the word true. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Oh, you are such a punk. I'll it's tell you, I, I was... I was just in an Uber in Charlotte this past weekend, and uh, I love to ask people where they're from because I've done a lot of traveling. And if you ask a person where they're from, it's an easy way to start the conversation. And the gentleman said that he was from West Africa. Well, I've been to Senegal a number of times on mission trips, so I can speak a little bit of what's called Wolof. It's the dialect there. So I just started speaking to this West African in Wolof, and you should have seen his face was just beaming. Of course. What is this? What is this white guy from from the U.S. speaking Wolof for? It just it just it blew his mind. But it 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 brought down some of those 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 barriers. It made the person feel loved. He felt a connection to me. We were able to have a great conversation. So I can usually within seconds ask a question or two, lead the conversation in a direction, find a point of commonality, make a person feel special and important. And I just want to leave a lasting impression on that person that number one, I care about them, but more importantly, there's a God that cares about them. And I just want to be one small vessel to make them feel better that day. That is so beautiful. And there, and there's just no better feeling than when you, when it's not about you and yet you know that you are having that kind of an impact on someone, right? Like there, that's, there, that's, that's the payoff. Well, look how happy he looks right now. Cause he's getting to talk about something that he's more passionate about than anything in his life. He's got a great yeah. business. He's got a great life, but what he is more passionate about is leaving every human being he meets feeling better about themselves than when they got there to meet him. And I love you for that. And, uh, I'm just telling you, it pays off, everybody. Look at him. He's not much to look at. Doesn't seem very smart. How's he do it? He is in love. He leads with his heart, not his head. That's all of you. Please fire your brains, hire your hearts, and be Jordan Kemper, right? That's exactly it. So let's talk about what you have transitioned in the last couple of years, because you, <clears throat> you've gone through some huge life changes. You got married. You, you left the company that you were with for the first 12, 13 years. You spent some time on a startup company, and then you ended up landing in an incredible home from a business perspective. And you have this beautiful three and a half year old daughter. So all this crazy change and, and you know, transformation has happened in your life. And, and I'm just curious, you know, now that you're a little bit more established in this company. You're now, you know, you're three and a half years into being a dad. You're, you know, how long you've been married, what, five years, something like that now? Almost, almost eight, almost eight. Eight years now. There you go. So you, you know, what is, what are you finding is changing for you as a leader now being a father, now being in this new environment that you're in? Like, what are, what are some of the things that are really showing up for you that are maybe more important than ever before with this different perspective? Yeah. So I feel like on a day to day basis, there's two games that we have to win. We have to win the game of business, right? Be successful, make money, be able to pay the bills, make money so that we can contribute. But there's a second game going on that people don't think nearly as much about. And that's the game of relationships. I mean, who cares if you're making all this money and your relationships are, are terrible? Y you're not winning at the game of life. You've got to win both games. And so oftentimes we'll compromise one to win the other. So I think the balance that every man and woman listening to this has to, to win at, it's this, it's this balancing act. It's this back and forth. I'll be the first to tell you, I don't have it figured out. I do my best to, to, to figure it out. But I think it's this 
you know, you do the best you can, you recalibrate. You do the best you can, you recalibrate. So as I look back over the first 10 years of my entrepreneurial journey, I was a single guy. I could travel, I could be up late, I could get up early. I, I, I was, you know, doing whatever I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. Enter in the picture of a, of a, of a spouse. Uh, she was a late night person, not a morning person. She liked doing things that I didn't. And so there's no doubt about it that the relationship started to shift in a different direction. And now for the first time in my career, I had to maximize the pockets of time in which to build my business. And so I actually found myself becoming more efficient because I had less time that I was willing to put towards the business. And then years later, enter in a three-year-old, you know, my, we had a, we had a baby girl. Now my pockets of time got even smaller. So I think what's really important is realizing that it's this constant juggling battle. And the best thing I can tell you is this, um, my college football coach used to tell me, he said, look, we need to be men of routine. I think we're human beings that thrive when we create habits. Habits ultimately lead to better results. And so I wanted to create habits in my life within those allotted time periods. So just a couple of examples. Uh, I wake up at 6.30. I do my quiet time. I read my Bible. And then I get my workout done before Kinley gets up. I spend from 8 o'clock till 9.30 every morning with my daughter. Uninterrupted. You can't get a hold of me. That's time with my daughter. And then I've got from about 9.30 till about 5.00 to work my respective businesses. And then from five till 8.30 every night, I hang out with Kinley until she goes to bed. That's family time. So that rhythm works for our family. We've got these times that are protected because I don't want to get five, 10 years down the road and look back and go, gee, you made crap tons of money, Jordan, but your daughter doesn't know you. Like that's not going to happen. My, my wife and daughter are going to get my best, not my leftovers. So everything is intentionally planned. My workouts are planned. My meals are planned. My, my work routine is planned. Even the, the hours that I do work, they're, they're time blocked as best as I can. Everything is scheduled. And people say, well, isn't that restrictive? No, it's not restrictive. It's freeing. It's freeing because I know what my routine is. And my routine is designed to give me the things that I want in life. And I want to make sure that I'm excelling in business, supporting those that are in partnership with me, while most importantly, taking care of Kristen and Kinley, who mean the most to me above all. All right. <clears throat> Let's take a break. We're going to come back right after this. This is the Legacy Leadership Radio Show with Adrian and Jordan. Important stuff. Please listen hard. Make the main thing the main thing. We'll be right back. All right. Pretty cool show. Going by very fast. It is a very good show. Hello, Hello. Alex Eaton. Hello, Christina Zaharia. Oh, Denise is just the best. So is Elizabeth. Oh, Anand is watching from Mumbai, mm -hmm. India. I don't even, I can't do that much math. So you can tell me what time it is there, but that's amazing. Jordan Adler, holy moly. <laughs> he's saying, no wonder he's watching. He's got eight feet of snow coming in at him. That's unbelievable. Well, and he's, you know, it's Jordan stick. Jordan's got to stick Jordan. together, man. Yep. Okay. Let's do it. And we are back. It's Tom Chenault, Adrian Chenault, final segment with Jordan Kemper. We've talked about family. We've talked about uh, different streams of income, how young people can absolutely make a big pivot and choose a career and excel at it inside of advice from other people that they're crazy. He was in medical school on the way to medical school and ended up just changing direction and building a gigantic organization. And I'm just, you know, now we're looking at the network marketing business I had a big meeting with the ANMP this morning with a woman named Donna Johnson and Garrett McGrath and all those guys talking about integrity and ethics in network marketing and how the companies seem to be going toward this single line compensation plan, which is disturbing at best. Uh, no one really knows where the profession is headed. And what do you think about that, all that, Jordan? And how are you positioning yourself in your career inside of that. You're a network marketer tried and true. I think your company is a network marketing company kind of playing like they're not these days, but what's going on out there? Do you, are you scared at all? You know, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, leadership is the most important thing that you can look for. And uh, I felt like, you know, the, the first company I spent 13 years with, 
I, I followed my mentor into that business. And it was because of my trust in him that I decided to partner with them. And that company made some incredible products, incredible decisions over a period of time. But what was interesting was I remember going to GoPro and various events and I would kind of sit there and I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because I'd see people talk about like switching from one company to another, or whatever. And I thought, well, that person's greedy. That person's greedy. Like, no, loyalty is finishing what you start. That was my mindset around business. And uh, a mentor of mine said, Jordan, your loyalty is misplaced. And I thought to myself, what, is that? what does that even mean? He said, Jordan, your loyalty is to the people that you serve. It's not to a company. It's not to a product. It's to people. And if you're in a position where you feel like your people are no longer in an environment where they can win, it's your obligation to leave. Well, that was hard to hear at the time because I'd been with them for 13 years. And so I had to find a scenario, I had to find a situation where number one, I believed in the leadership of the company, I aligned with the quality of the products, and I wanted to make sure that there was a fair and lucrative business opportunity for those that chose, chose to join me. And uh, my wife and I can say with confidence that when we invite someone to participate in the business, we know with certainty that if that person is willing to work hard, they are set up to be successful in that scenario. So as I look at right now, a lot of the companies that are out there, I see bad leadership. I see some companies that are run by people that are unethical. I see immoral situations, whether or not those companies are going to be able to work through this recession. I think we've got a situation where the, the herd is going to be thinned. It's going to be thinned. And I think the strong ethical companies that are willing to stay relevant and move in the right direction are the ones that are going to win. So I would, I would encourage anyone. Uh, listening to this, that you have to make sure that you have some diversity in your income streams. Now, I think it's a mistake for someone with little experience to try and do three or four things at the same time and not do any of them well. So I think what worked well for me was I became an expert at network marketing before I started adding various income streams. But once I excelled and became an expert at one thing, I did start adding layers of income to really give us that security and, and certainty that we needed to make sure that our family was, was provided for. So I share all of that to say this, with the banks going down, with the uncertainty in our economy, who knows what's gonna happen? But one thing's for sure, uh, I've gained the people skills necessary to figure out whatever could be next. And God forbid something ever happens to my company, uh, you can't take my skills, you can't take my personal development, you can't take my personal education away from me, those skills could be applied to a new scenario. And that's why I think the most important investment anyone can make is the investment in themselves. When you invest in yourself, you create a situation where you can add value to others. And the company, it's important, but it's not the most important thing. You are the asset and you've got to remember that. That's strongly said. There's a, uh, on the, on the same conversation this morning, we talked about people rating other companies, you know, and it's very troubling to me. It's very troubling to that entire board of a culture from a company rating other companies and downlines and paying people to, you know, it's just, it gets kind of ugly. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's to your point, it's a tricky situation. I think, you know, without naming names, there's a lot of companies out there that kind of got their start. Uh, by rating another company. That's kind of how they got the genesis of their company started. And now they've got a successful company and maybe they hit a lull in their business. And before you know it, another company ends up taking some of their people away and they're frustrated and they're arguing that it was rating. This is my stance. Uh, I think every person has the right to go to whatever company they feel is right for them. I do think it's a mistake to follow this shiny object syndrome of just jumping around at the, the next best opportunity or the false promises. But, you know, as I even looked at the GoPro stage, most of the individuals that spoke on stage as a seven or eight figure earner, most of them have been in two or three companies throughout their career. Sure. And again, they, they did so ethically, but naturally, just like in corporate America, I do think leaders will tend to transition throughout their, their time period. 
It's very rare. You know, Donna Johnson's a great example. Jeff Roberti's a good example. There's a few scenarios where somebody will be with one company for the longevity of their career. And I think that would be an ideal scenario for everyone. But make no mistake about it. The golden rule is treat others as you would want to be treated. So when it comes to business, I think that's the simple rule. Do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not just because you're going to make a buck. All right. We are out of here. Who's our guest next week? Marina Ware. Marina Ware on Denise's birthday. Going to be a giant show. And uh, we're coming back. Denise and I will do that. You're fired. And uh, it will be an incredible show for Denise's 35th birthday. So it's going to be very, very exciting. We'll see you next week. We love you so much, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Don't hang up. What a great job. show. That was yeah. awesome. You're a great kid. And I'm telling you what. I hijacked you with a bunch of questions today that you didn't have coming and you took a licking and kept on ticking and just rolled with the punches because you're so educated and so well-versed and you know so yourself so well that you know what's going to come out of your mouth. And you can just tell that you, that you're comfortable in your own skin and you're not answering to some false prophet. And I really, really appreciate you've grown up. It's been a while since I did spend some time with you. And I want you to tell you that I'm very, very proud of you. Well, so that's cool. That. And I think that are... I think that we can probably attribute all your success to that conversation Lisa Grossman had with you where you said you need to meet Tom Chanel. <laughs> that's a joke. That's right. So I'm kidding. That's so right. that's cool. Don't take it, <laughs> so I'll take it well, away. Well, I'll tell you guys this. My uh you know, I I'm thinking about where, where do you want me to go now, God? Like, what, what, what do you want? What's next for me? And uh, I, I feel this passion for this intersection between faith and business. And I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like, but I want to teach people to excel at business. I want to teach them to do it exceptionally well with integrity, but I don't know. I, I have this, just this heartbeat for faith. And I feel like our world right now is temperamental. People are quick to take offense. Uh, they're, they're, they're racially and, and politically and economically charged. And so I just feel in my heart that like faith is the one thing that people really need the most. But I think rather than it just coming from a pastor or a minister, if they can hear it from somebody that does what they do and is in the trenches of the marketplace day in and day out, it's just going to be falling on a different set of ears. So I'm, 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 I'm kind of trying to figure out what that looks like, but I know that I'm, I'm passionate and I'll figure it out. So just want to say thanks to you guys. Yeah. Th thank you. And, and, you know, I, I can feel your heart and, you know, I think doing my, my encouragement and, and where I'd love to, you know, play in that sandbox with you is, you know, how do we do that in a way that isn't, you know, I, I've seen it. There's, there's been a little bit of this kind of thing going on. I've noticed the last month, two months where suddenly maybe talking a certain game is it, from a faith perspective is almost kind of the cool thing to do all of a sudden. And it's funny how quickly it sort of the pendulum swung that way. And what I want to do is to meet people where they are, wherever they are on that faith journey and, and not to have it be that, okay, well now there's this new code language that you're supposed to speak to be in the cool club. And I know that's how you are too, that it's, it isn't about that. It's really about like, how do you, how, like, what does a life well lived look like? What does a life living in faith really look like? And how do we, how do we make that something that we can invite anybody to be a part of, regardless of what their background is, regardless of if they know all the jargon or whatever that is. And so, you know, I think that's a, that's a really important thing to, to live out and, and to, to figure out how we do together. And so I, I love, and I can feel your passion for that. Well, hell with that. I do not believe anybody should be successful in any way, shape or form, unless they're part of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what that is no that isn't where you go you go you you know you gotta love like crazy then love more and i might not be right where all of you want me i am pretty sure you're not and i'm not and that's okay with me because where yeah. i am not is not where you want me to be probably but i'm exactly where god's got me and that's all that matters and yeah. i may drink the kool-aid about this or that one of these days or I may not, 
but I am firmly convinced that there's something bigger than Tom Chenault running this show. And I just acquiesce all my will to that and uh, to a God of my understanding. And it's worked out pretty doggone well. And I hope you all feel the same way and uh, pretty fun stuff. Huh, Paco? Really, really fun. Don't Jordan, thank you so much. Say hello to Kristen from us. And we just love, love what you're doing and what you stand for. So thank you so much. And you guys could come back to Longmont and see the old homestead with Bob and the family and see us. Will you please? Yeah. When it gets top of Florida, we'll, uh, we'll come visit Colorado. All right. There all right. we go. You guys got it. Right. Love you. Thank Thanks, you. Guys.